There oh, we go. They're like, wait, no, oh, oh, yeah, here we go. We're ready for it. Yes, <laughs> it's, it's Tuesday, guys. It is it's fun. We, I love when we start off the show laughing already. <laughs> because <laughs> it's already because it's tuesday because it's tuesday it's hey you want to know a, a funny thing that you may or may not want to do and i did this like uh, a half hour ago go back and look at some of our first videos from when we first started quarantine and look at yourself now like i think we all aged in like dog years <laughs> uh -uh. <laughs> you're saying we don't look bright and refreshed it's yeah, definitely like, accelerated yeah. the process i've yes. got a whole old man beard now there's some grays in it right <laughs> Because our grooming, our grooming is a little different. That's a all. A little shaggy, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> that one's the lawn's clothes. <laughs> right? Hey, go outside and get some sunshine and a little vitamin D. It'll put a smile on your face. And today's the perfect day to do it. We got great weather again today. We had beautiful weather yesterday. Take a look at our live camera of Grant Park. Beautiful blue skies, nice green trees, really, really pleasant conditions out there today. We're looking at a high temperature of 84 degrees today. Just sun throughout the day. You might see an errant cloud here or there, but nothing bad to speak of. Uh, another beautiful day really again tomorrow, too. We're going to look at a high of 87 on Wednesday. Uh, sun, you might see a few clouds move their way in, in afternoon, midday hours, but really not bad. Thursday and Friday, we start creeping up there in the above normal temperature range. And especially on Friday, 92 degrees, we're going to see that humidity really start to build in. And then late in the overnight hours, Friday into Saturday morning, that's when you can start seeing some showers and thunderstorms start popping up. Saturday, also the equinox, it is the first, or sorry, solstice, it is the first day of summer, officially at 4.44 p.m. on Saturday. We will be into summer, the longest day of the year. Ooh. And of course, it's going to be a rainy one. Also on Sunday, you have a chance of some scattered showers and thunderstorms throughout the day. And then Monday, uh, the air starts to dry out a little bit. It gets a little less humid, but cooler temperatures, 82 degrees. So it should be a nice day on Monday as well. We just got to get that weekend in there with a little bit of rain. We'll yes. fight through it. <laughs> Fingers crossed things start improving soon. Yeah, exactly. Thanks a lot, Amy. Um, let's get to it because our first guest is already here, everybody. We're going to welcome Nicole Witt to the jam. And she's executive director of the Adoption Consultancy and Adoption Consultant. And we felt like this was an important conversation to have right now because even though the, we have this pandemic going on, people are still looking to plan their families and expand their families. Mm -hmm. Nicole, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Yes, what are you seeing during this time with everything that's going on with coronavirus? Well, I am seeing that domestic adoptions of newborns are continuing to go forward. That's the area that I work in. It is different for international adoption than for foster adoption, but domestic newborn adoption is going forward. People have to get creative, you know, with some of the logistics of how to do it. But generally speaking, it's happening, which is really exciting. I was telling, you know, these guys, we talked a little bit before the show, I have a friend who recently adopted and they were able to do, uh, to get their baby and then do their court, initial court case uh, via Zoom with the judge. Yeah, that's what a lot of the judges are doing now, which is, which is great. Um, and it's, it's worked out nicely because a lot of people adopt from different states in, than the one in which they live. So now if they don't even have to think about, should we spend the money to go back there for the finalization? Because it's not always required, but it's a nice event to be part of. But now they can do it by Zoom and, and have that participation without the travel. Is there a particular age group that uh, there's a more pressing need for adoption? Well, with, with private domestic adoption, it's almost always newborn. So usually the pre-adoptive parents match with an expectant mom during the course of her pregnancy. And then they adopt, you know, pretty much immediately after birth when the baby's discharged from the hospital, goes immediately into the custody of the adoptive parents. Mm, nice. Are you finding that there are a lot of parents who are considering adoption are kind of holding off just for the simple fact that they're worried the baby's being born in the hospital. There's a lot of, you know, the frontline responders and the COVID cases in these hospitals. Could I get it? Could I not get it? Is that causing a little bit of delays for some people getting into adoption? For some people, I think it is causing some concern. And also, you know, some people aren't sure what's going to happen with their jobs and their income and, you know, that sort of thing. So um, I think some people are, are delaying it. But, you know, if, if people are planning to maybe get it started a little bit down the road, this extra time at home is a great opportunity for them to be getting, you know, some of their paperwork together and their plans in order and just getting really prepared so that when the time is right for them, they can jump right in. 
So earlier, um, Amy was sharing a, a particular instance where a couple was having some difficulty. And of course, I've heard stories just out in the community, people that I know that have had difficulty with adoption. Why is it so hard? What are some of those roadblocks that people run into? Because unless you've gone through that process, you just kind of think that there's so many families out there that want these kids and so many kids that want families. Why can't we just match right. them? Right. Well, you know, that is really more if you're talking about foster adoption, the kids who are really in need of families. If we're talking about adoption of newborns, there are so many more people who want to adopt than there are babies being placed for adoption these days. So that's really, you know, the key thing that, that can make it really difficult. And there are no guarantees in the process, which makes it hard as well. You know, the expectant mom can always choose to parent up until her consent forms are irrevocable. Sometimes that's immediately upon her signing them, you know, maybe a day or two after birth. Sometimes there's a grace period where she has some window after that, but she always has the option of parenting. So there are no guarantees up until that moment. So that's, you know, really stressful for, for the pre-adoptive parents. I got a question and you may not even be able to answer it fully just because all of this is so new. The Supreme Court ruled yesterday uh, on transgender and uh, bisexual uh, civil laws. There was a, an issue before that President Trump was uh, working on that would have allowed some adoption agencies right. to uh, to grant parents children based on their sexual preferences. Is right. this is that Supreme Court law going to affect this? Um, well, with that, with the previous law, um, again, that can affect a lot more with foster adoption because it impacts agencies that receive federal funds. And those are usually agencies that are doing foster adoption, although some of them do both foster adoption and private adoption. So I think we're, I, I don't think the new ruling really impacts that at all. Um, where that comes into play and, and can hurt people um, is really in kind of maybe the smaller areas, more rural, more homogenous, where um, LGBTQ families wouldn't have a lot of options for finding other agencies who are willing to work with them. But if they're in sort of a, a diverse urban area, there will always be other agencies who are willing to work with them. So they just need to, to go to the right places. Uh, you know, I think who it really hurts is those children in foster care, um, you know, for those agencies that say, well, we're not gonna place the same sex families that's so many less or fewer opportunities for the babies to or the children in foster care to go into a loving home, especially since LGBTQ families are about seven times more likely to be looking to adopt out of foster care. Mm. I'm sure that starting the process of adoption can be an intimidating one because it's a process people just aren't used to. So what how do you even begin? What what is assembling a team to do that look like? Right. Well, that's so I'm an adoption consultant and that's where adoption consultants come into play. It's not required for people to use one. But what consultants do is we work. I tell people we're kind of like wedding planners for adoption. So we guide the pre-adoptive parents step by step through the whole process and, and serve solely as sort of an advocate for them. So for people who want to take that approach, that really can be the best place to start and just say, you know, I, I want somebody who's just going to walk me step by step through this. Um, but for people who, who don't want to go that way, um, you know, there is a lot of conflicting information out there. The best thing to do is you know, once you've decided which type of adoption, so say you select newborn domestic adoption, is really finding a good reputable agency that can guide you through that. And if, if you decide that you're just going to work with that one agency, they can guide you through the process. One of the other options, and it's the area where consultants work more in, is that you do have the option of signing up with multiple agencies. So that can help things go a lot faster. You have a lot more opportunities for finding that right match. Um, so again, that, that's another benefit to the consultant side, but if that's just not right for you and you just want to work with one place, then that's really the first step is finding that reputable agency to sign up with. What if somebody comes to you and they're starting to have the discussion about adoption in their family? Maybe they have a natural child of their own or they don't and they might want one later. Are there anything you can tell parents to guide them whether or not that would be right for their family? 
in terms of if adoption would be right for their yeah, family. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, most of the people that I work with are, have spent years kind of working through fertility treatments and they don't necessarily have that option. Or even if they already have a biological child or children, they're unable to have more. So it's relatively rare that people who can still have biological children in the future do pursue adoption. It happens sometimes, but because adoption is, you know, a difficult process, it's emotionally difficult, it's financially difficult, um, it's really relatively rare for people to pursue it if they're able to have biological children. I know because we I, looked into adoption a little bit after my oldest was born because we struggled with my other ones and mm -hmm. were a little concerned about adopting after having our natural child and what kind of relationship we would have with the adopted child and then with our own natural child. Yeah, I mean, I have lots and lots of clients who have had biological children first and then adopted. And, you know, from what I know, and I don't necessarily stay in touch with all of them many years down the road, but the ones that I do stay in touch with, um, it, it's, you know, to them, there's, there's not a difference that way through the child. And, you know, a lot of it depends on what is the openness that they have, what's the relationship with the birth parents. Um, sometimes that really develops into a beautiful sort of extended family situation where now there are even more people um, loving the children and it can really be a, a positive thing. Um, but they do have to be aware of it. You can't just pretend it doesn't exist, right? You do have to be aware of it. Do, do the work, do the research to make sure that both of the children are growing up in a healthy environment. I'm curious as to how you coach people and whether or not they should be looking at a infant or if they should be looking at a child that's older. Yeah, I mean, again, that there, there you're really talking about, you know, private adoption versus foster adoption. And most people, it, to them, it's pretty clear what the right fit is to them, right? That's not something that people tend to struggle with for, for too long. You know, people who um, are, are open to adopting an older child who understand that in some instances they've had some trauma in their past and they really want to um, do something benevolent and help that child. And it's not so much about having the newborn experience. Um, that can really be such a great fit for them. Um, but for people who have, again, really struggled with infertility and are really looking to have that newborn experience and to, you know, raise the child from day one, you know, then it's just obvious that, that the private adoption is the better fit for them. So it's actually not something that tends to be that difficult of a decision for people. They tend to be pretty clear on which path is the right fit for them and for their family and for that child. You mentioned um, private adoption as well as foster adoption. What's mm -hmm. the difference between- the So foster adoption is through the state. So it's through the foster system. And that is when you are almost always, not always, but almost always, talking about older children who have been removed from their biological parents' care by the state and placed into temporary foster homes. Um, and that is, um, from a cost perspective, um, it's free or virtually free, plus there can be a lot of financial benefits for the, the child and the family, sometimes even free in-state college tuition, free healthcare, things like that. With private adoption, that's where you match with the expectant mom during her pregnancy and adopt a newborn. So that's going to be done through a private agency or private attorney, not through the state. Um, and it can be a much more expensive procedure as well because you are paying for the attorney's fees and the court fees and um, her pregnancy related expenses and, and that kind of thing. Um, so those are some of the key differences between the two. I, I don't think that I've ever heard of having a consultant for an adoption. So I, I'm liking it to just from listening to talk kind of like a concierge, if you will, for parents. So do you do help them with the paperwork, their books to describe the family and then matching with the correct mom and, and all of that down the road? Well, we help with, with their books, those profile books that the expectant mom looks at to select who she wants to match with. And we do help with their, their paperwork. Um, we don't do matching. So that's a really important difference. Um, the agencies and the attorneys are the ones who work with the expectant moms and do the matching. The consultants work exclusively with and for the adoptive parents. Um, but one of the things we do is that we have a nationwide network of agencies and attorneys with whom we work. So we can create that customized plan for each client and get them with the places that are gonna be able to help them best rather than them needing to do all that research and legwork on their own. Wow, that's um, amazing. Yeah, that can certainly be helpful. Yeah. 
Um, I am curious to know what your response would be to this question, um, because uh, my, my husband and I, we have talked about adopting, not seriously, but to the point where we do have members of our family who work in social services and work mm -hmm. for state agencies, and they have um, somewhat discouraged it, uh, an older child just in the sense that you never know what you're going to get. And I guess that's kind of true for any situation right, right. your own child you never know what you're going to get but it does kind of make me you know get put some fear into you know the situation and so how would you advise yeah you know unfortunately that's something that keeps a lot of people from adopting out of the foster care system because a lot of those children have experienced trauma you know and and they're nervous about what would that mean in our family, what, what situation might we be bringing into our family. But those children, you know, they need a good and loving, stable home. You know, the thought of all these kids who stay in the system and then age out um, is, is really tragic. But it does take, you know, the right family to to realize, you know, there, there may be some unexpected issues. We're going to have to be able to have the resources to support this child and whatever needs they might end up having. But like you said, with any child, that's kind of how it is. You never really know, you know, what the situation is going to end up being. There's always a leap of faith involved. Yeah. yeah even with your own kids. <laughs> yeah. For sure. Well, Nicole, thank you so much. Great information there. Uh, really great conversation and an important one for sure. Let's get Nicole's information up on the screen here for the Adoption Consultancy. You can see uh, the Facebook there and the adoptionconsultancy.com. Nicole, thank you very much. Thanks so much, you guys. Have a great day. Thanks, Thanks you too. Nicole. Oh, she's just helping so many people, I so know. many families. I just, Thanks. having a, a, such a close friend that just went through all of this, I didn't know there was consultants that could have done that. I mean, I feel like, mm -hmm. I feel like if they would have known that six months ago, how much easier their life's could have been. Yeah, that was news to me too. It's a good resource for sure. Yeah.